Hey everybody, this is Dr. Maple. So we're coming back to our research methods lectures. Today we're going to talk about theory. And I realize that may actually seem like a really strange topic because this is a research methods class. And on top of that, I know many of you are taking the theory course with Dr. Pellucci this semester. Well, the cool thing is, is the things that you learn in that class somewhat overlap with how we do things in research methods. Also, for those of you who take our uh, 470 senior thesis course in the spring, you'll actually have a chance to put some of these ideas into practice. So let's talk a little bit about where, th where theory fits into the research process. Now, I guess I have to start um, where I was as an undergraduate, when I took the theory class, I was overwhelmed as a student. There was a lot of information, and the person that I was working with was actually a pretty famous critical theorist who um, had some really big ideas. And I just remember trying to, instead of focus on all the crazy details of all these different ideas, I just tried to start approaching each of these ideas in the same way I might think about any big idea. Um, so, for example, um, let's think of some of the big ideas that we've learned in our lives. We've learned how to wait in line. We've learned how to register for classes. We've learned how to walk across the street. These are all big ideas. We've learned how to talk to people. These are big ideas, and they kind of shape how we know how to do things and so forth. Theories actually aren't any different. Theories are big ideas that we can use to make sense of what we see in our data, or likewise even influence what kind of data we might be looking for. It's interesting because with sociology, remember, we are very much a science that falls right into the scientific method with all the other sciences. And theory to them is important, and theory to us is important. So what we're going to try to do today is take some of the fear out, that you might experience out of theory. Um, what we're going to do is boil it down to some very basic components and try to think about some very simple ways in which you as a student could put theory to use in any of your projects. All right. If you ever have any questions about this concerns, you can always get in touch with me. Uh, I'm always happy to talk more about this idea because I realize it's a bit challenging. All right, let's get started. So before we even try to explain what a theory is, we really need to start with the building blocks of what we need to get to theories. And that actually starts with hypotheses. Now, for a simple definition for now, because we're going to come back to a whole lecture talking about hypotheses, a hypothesis is kind of like an educated guess. Um, but it's an educated guess that's also something you can test with data. Let's pretend that we are working with my data set that you'll see later this semester, um, dealing with um, variables that influence students' grades in a particular class. Um, we will see all sorts of different things that might influence their final grade, and so you'll kind of get to play around with that data set and find out for yourself what influence impacts their final grades. But let's pretend that I have an educated guess based on my experiences that um, students who miss more classes are probably going to score lower. I could go out and I could find um, studies that have maybe already been done on a similar topic, and cite those in my paper and learn what they had to say. And then at some point, maybe I could collect my own data to try to understand how student outcomes might be linked to certain behaviors. And then I could create my first hypothesis. A hypothesis is a statement, and it's something that we can test with analytical stuff like, uh, you know, um, t-tests and regression and so forth. We'll get to that in a minute, or not even in a minute. We'll get to that in several weeks from now, so don't worry. But let's pretend that my hypothesis is something like, um, I expect that students who miss more classes will have lower grades uh, than students who miss less classes. That's a straightforward, simple hypothesis. It's a statement, and I can test it, creating some variables in there, and go with it. We'll talk about those ideas another day. What happens with theories is that we get lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of hypotheses, and they're tested and tested and tested. And over time, all these studies kind of point back to the same big idea, that um, some particular thing is happening. That's where we get into the realm of the theory. A theory is a proven idea that we expect um, could shape a, a relationship or an activity that we might be studying. Now, one of the things that's important to remember is theories aren't 100% ideas. It's not like gravity. Gravity always applies, ooh, except in certain vacuum situations, so even it's not 100%. Theories instead are designed to help us uh, make sense of what we're seeing. 
and they don't always apply. And in fact, theories adjust over time. Theories have exceptions. Theories have uh, changes. Theories can even be disproven as society changes. But all in all, a theory is a big idea. It's not something scary. It can't harm you. A theory is a big idea that we can use as a valuable starting point in our research, whether it comes early in our research or maybe it comes later in our research. Let's try to break down how we would use theory in a research methods paper, or perhaps you're thinking about your thesis already for uh, 470, how you'd use theory in that particular paper. Now, first off, we have to think about how theories are something that can be categorized into different levels. You may have heard these phrases before because we use them in sociology to think about units of analysis, whether we're looking at very close one-on-one -on -one relationships, slightly bigger relationships like how counties might interact, or how like macro things like countries interact with each other. Theories can be categorized along these same lines. Micro theories are thinking about an individual interaction. Uh, the looking glass self is a great example of that. Looking glass self, for those of you who not, might not be familiar with it, and by the way, it's hyperlinked in the PowerPoint. But the looking glass self is the idea that we can adjust um, our understanding of how others see us by changing our presentation of self. So for example, if I want to look professional, I might put on a suit instead of wearing a t-shirt. I might brush my beard a little more rather than not brushing it at all. So we can change how others see us. That's a micro level theory. Meso level theories kind of grow a little bit. They get a little bigger. They think about group dynamics. Um, I like to think about ethnic enclaves. In fact, that's part of my research agenda from when I was a PhD student. Um, so the ethnic enclave theory is an idea that expresses how immigrant groups experience the labor market differently than people already living in the country um, who are not immigrants. So this is definitely still thinking about individuals, but do you see how now we're dealing with groups of individuals? Also, too, we can see with meso theories, they might look at a slightly bigger area, um, thinking about how like one county might experience something compared to another county. With meso theories, we're just trying to get a little bit bigger. So now we're not dealing with one-on-one -on -one interactions now, we're dealing with like groups and categories. Macro theories are the big ones. And we are blessed to have an extraordinary theorist who teaches a whole class on macro theories. Actually, he teaches a couple of classes, I believe now, in Dr. Pellucci, um, talking about macro theories. Macro theories are looking at very massive systematic forces, such as inequality. In fact, Dr. Pellucci's class on world systems theory talks all about how inequality is created through how different countries interact. And it's all organized in this global system. So do you see how these theories are growing? We went from micro theories that are dealing with one-on-one -on -one stuff, meso theories get slightly bigger, we're now dealing with groups, and now macro theories that are trying to explain these massive forces that would shape everyone's experience. They can overlap too. I want to be very, very clear about that. We do sometimes see cases where the theoretical uh, levels can overlap. You can also use multiple theories in a paper to try and explain things. So that's something to keep in mind. But these categories are kind of a useful way of starting to break down a really big idea into some smaller pieces. That's actually where we're gonna stop this first lecture. Now in our upcoming lectures, we're gonna talk more about when and how we use theory in our research papers. If at any point you have questions, come back and chat with me. I'm happy to help them on this. Again, I remember what it was like to be an undergraduate student taking research methods and also to be taking those theory classes. And they're intense, but they're good in the fact that you learn a lot of really cool ideas. And you're gonna find that when we start your senior theses, as many of you will uh, in the coming semester, you're gonna be able to do these things. That's gonna be excited. All right, if you have any questions, you know where to find me. We'll talk soon. See ya.